to the top floor, we walked up a flight of stairs, he unlocked the door, and we walked out onto a, the roof, the flat roof of this three-story building, and it had no protection around the edges, no railings or anything, and he simply walked over to the edge, and he said, now, Mike, you see over that building, we produce our uh, vaccines in that building. I said, hey, Tim, I'm holding on to the door way back over there. I, I, I couldn't go anywhere close. So I, I have a fear of heights. Now, the Bible says again and again, fear not, fear not. I, I read somewhere that it says that phrase, fear not, 365 times in the Bible, each one time for each day of the year. It's not altogether true, because I know that in the King James Version, that phrase, fear not, appears over 500 times. And so I think God knew that we are people who tend to fear, that we stress. And so he put it in the Bible through the Holy Spirit for us to fear not, fear not. In 2 Timothy, we read there, the Bible says that we should not have a spirit of fear. If you have a spirit of fear, that is terrible. And I've also read that um, the, the new pandemic today is the stress, fear. And con a little stress is not bad, but to have continual stress is actually not good for your health. You also read in the Bible that we should have a fear for God. Now that means that we should have a rev rev reverence for God, that we should respect God, that we should regard Him in awe and wonder because He's Almighty God. But there are some people, and that really grinds with me, and I'm sure you've heard them. Now, I don't want to be res disrespectful, but you know those people who say things like they prefer to God as the old man upstairs? It, it grinds with me. We need to refer to God with respect. Fear not. And not too many young people here today, but I, I think many young people fear about the future of this country. Many young people few, fear and, uh, about their, their future careers in this country. And so I want this morning to uh, look at First Samuel chapter 23. It's a long chapter, so I'm not going to read through the whole chapter, but I want to refer to it as we go along. Because there we see that David is under tremendous stress. He must have been terribly afraid for his life. And so we want to, I want us to look at that this morning. But during that time when he was in 1 Samuel chapter 23, he wrote a number of psalms, including Psalm 27. And I want to read that to us this morning. It's going to appear up on the screen for us. And um, we, we're going to just read this. And you know, so many of the Psalms, is, it's David speaking to the Lord. He's speaking in prayer to the Lord. So see how he speaks to God in this prayer, in the Psalm 27. And this translation is from the New Living Translation and I'm going to read it to you, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, notice that word fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surround me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in His temple. 
for he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Notice the high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary I will offer sacrifices and shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O oh God, my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Teach me how to live, O oh Lord. Lead me along the right path where my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into your hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done, and every breath they threaten me with violence. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Before I go into the message as such, I, I want to just give you some background to this particular chapter. Uh, Saul is jealous of David, and, and he's out to kill David. And, and this chapter opens where the Philistines are raiding the people of Caleb. And, and uh, David has uh, 600 men. They're a motley bunch. They are a bunch of riffraff people that most of them are, are, are fleeing from the law. Uh, they're running from the law. And, and David's got these 600 men. And David then prays to God and says, God, do you want me to attack these Philistines and, and save the people of Caleb from the, the marauding Philistines. And God says, yes, go. And, and so David takes his 600 men and he drives these Philistines off and he brings back the booty. Now, I imagine, I imagine that David must have thought, you know, after I've done this for the people of Kayla, I can hide here safely and, and they won't let me down. But something must have made him suspicious. Because he asks God, God, are these people here at Kayla going to hand me over to Saul? And God said, yes, they will. And I think he just, God, I think you're making a mistake, you know, because I've done so much for these people. So he asks God a second time, will they betray me? And God says, yes. And so David and his 600 men leave Kayla and they go to another area of Ziph. It's called Ziph. And the people of Ziph send a message to Saul saying, Hey, Saul, we know where David is. He's here among us at Ziph. We know where he's hiding. We can take you there. And I think David got wind of this. And so uh, David and his 600 men leave Ziph and they go off uh, to uh, Engedi. Now, at Engedi, there is um, the, the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth, 1,200 feet below sea level. And um, in that area is what we know today is called Masada. There, there is a rock outcrop that goes up. Um, the highest point is 1,200 feet, 400 meters up, straight up. The top is flat. And Herod the Great made this his hiding place, his fortress. And it was only one way up, and that was a snake path that went up the side. And Herod the Great had a four-meter wall built around the top. 
He had two palaces built up there, there were army barracks, there was a warehouse for food, complex system of um, collecting rainwater that went into cisterns. It is said that he could live there for 10 years, he had enough water and food. So this was an amazing fortress. And here, David is on the run. And so we see, this is my first point, David's problems. David's problems. And so he's on the run. And he's in this area of Engedi, in the area of this rock. It was referred to as the rock. Today we know it as Masada. He was in this area, and, and I want you to just realize that it's been seven years that he's been on the run. Every morning that he wakes up, will it be today that Saul gets me and kills me? Every morning for seven years when he wakes up, I've got to stay at least one step ahead of Saul. The pressure, the stress. When your life is under threat like David's was, we, there's nothing more stressful than that. And it is during that time of stress that he writes Psalm 27. It, it, he also wrote Psalm 31 where he refers to the rock and the, this fortress. He also wrote Psalm 54 and he refers to Ziph. He may have even written Psalm 63 during this time as he describes the desert. And he may even have written Psalm 91. Now that's interesting. Here was a man, David. David had fought Goliath and killed Goliath for Saul. Saul was the one who should have fought Goliath. But Saul didn't have the courage. And so David did that job for him. As you read, you find that David won many wars against the Philistines for Saul. In the earlier years, when Saul's soul was troubled, young David would, was sent to play his harp and sing to Saul to calm him down. In spite of all that David had done, huh, Saul wants to kill him. And I imagine that David would have said, said life's, not, life's not fair, boy. And, and you may not be, you're not being stalked by a killer. But you may also be under stress. You may be going through a difficult time. Now, I don't know what it is, you know. And you are troubled. And you are possibly saying, life isn't fair. It's not my fault that this is the situation. Now, I want to tell you. If you are saying that life isn't fair, I want to tell you that life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. We are living in a troubled world, a fallen world. We are living in a fallen world. A teacher asked her young class, if there was anything that they feared. And she found it very interesting that young children do have fears. But we, we, we're afraid to be left on our own. We fear that our, our parents are going to separate and get divorced. They, they shared the, the, the pressure of schoolwork that they have put on them. The pressure of 
their peers, peer pressure. And so even children have fears and stresses. Now, now David admitted that he had these fears. He admitted his stress. Have you faced yours? Have you faced yours? Faith and fear are inversely related. If, if this hand is faith and this hand is fear, you find that when faith goes up, fear goes down. But when faith goes down, fear goes up. They are inversely, inversely related. And so when we look at the crime and, and the corruption and the wrong decisions that are made in this country, we become fearful. But remember what the Bible says, that we walk by faith and not by sight. It's like walking on a tightrope, and on the one side, if you fall off onto fear, there's no safety net. But on the other side where there is faith, the safety net is God. A number of years ago, I remember reading this, and I think if my memory serves me correctly, it happened in New Zealand, where they, you could go up on a hot air balloon and do a bungee jump on the hot air balloon. But with the one man, the rope was too long, and he jumped to his death, and then they banned him. I will tell you that there are people in Richard's Bay, there are people that may even be part of this congregation and this church who are trying to live life without God. And their rope is too long. You put your trust in God. God says, I have your right. And it won't be too long. And it won't be too short. David had tremendous stress. He had tremendous fears. And so from this chapter, I, I see that this, what I've shared with you, is David's problem. Now, secondly, I want us to just look at God's provision, God's protection. We've seen the problem. Now I want you to see the, the provision from God. And, and we may look at, the, at David's experience with God and how God provided for him. But we can't say that that is exactly what God will do for you. You can't put God in a box and say, God, this is how it must be in, in my particular case. You can't put God in a box. The first thing about God's provision in this chapter is I see the provision of prayer. God provided an avenue of prayer for David. And in verses 20, in chapter 23 and verses 2 and 4, I want to read it. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, Go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. Verse 4. Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go down to Caleb, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So you see, David played, prayed a very simple prayer. It, it wasn't a complicated prayer. But as you look into the Psalms, you see that here was a man who was close to God, who, who really spoke to God and, and just shared his heart with God. Now, if you want to know the rock in your life, you need to spend time in prayer. You need to build a relationship with the Lord. 
and that takes care. It takes time. Now, when I say it takes prayer, I'm not talking about the prayer you pray before you eat when you say grace. Uh, if you do that, that's that's very good. You must do that. I, I'm not talking about the quick prayers, what I call telegram prayers, that you may pray from time to time. Uh, there's a place for that. I'm not talking about the prayer that you pray on your way to work. That's fine. I am talking about when you spend time with God and you share your heart with God. You may want to get down on your knees if you really mean business. I suggest that you even pray audibly. Our whole household doesn't have to know about it if we hear you. But, but just pray audibly to the Lord. And tell Him those fears. Tell him about those stresses that you experience. Share your heart with God. And you know what you will find? The more you pray about those stresses, the less they become. The less they become. There's something I just would like to tag on here. David prayed, yes, he prayed, and that was right, that was good. But, but I want you to notice that David didn't sit at home on his bench and, and pray and just wait for God to do something. He acted and asked God for help. And, uh, you, you know, it seems to be something like that, that in other cases where it is perhaps more of a test of, of faith where with Naaman comes to Elisha and asks for, for healing from leprosy and the Bible says that Naaman expected Elisha to pray for him and wave his hand over him and he would be healed. But instead he had to do something. He had to go and dip himself in the River Jordan seven times. We, we see with the walls of Jericho, they had to do something. They had to march around for seven days, seven times, and then the walls came down. I always think of the man the first morning getting up, putting on his battle dress, grabbing his weapon, and uh, wife says, well, good luck, you know, I hope you win the battle today. He comes home that evening, and she said, how did it go? What did you do? Uh, we walked, marched around the walls. Oh, we didn't attack Jericho. No. Second day, comes home. So what did you do today? We attacked Jericho. Uh, we just walked around the walls. No. The third day, he comes home that evening. She says, I suppose you just walked around the walls, did you? Yes, we did. But on the seventh day, the walls came down. It looks as though they had to do something. And you know, even with Jesus, when the, the ten lepers came, Jesus said, Show yourselves to the priest. And and they went, and on their way there, they were healed. It, it looks as though we have to do something. So, some years ago, a man, a fine man, wonderful biblical knowledge, but he'd been without a job for some time. And and so I said to him, so, so what are you doing about this job situation? Oh, he said, I'm praying about that. I said, well, that's good. And, and what else are you about doing about getting a job? And, and I quote what he said. He said, I'm just waiting to see what God is going to do. I said to him, Liz, you don't perhaps think that God is waiting to see what you are going to do. You see? I think Perhaps if he had have, have, have made contact with some agents or looked and, and applied and knocked on doors and tried to get a job and pray. And, and so I, I just see there's some action that David took. A, pastor, a man came to see a pastor and 
he said to the pastor, Pastor, if I'm in a rowing boat crossing a river and I get caught into the stream and I'm heading towards a waterfall in this boat, should I pray or should I row? And the pastor said, you must pray as if you can't row and you must row as if you can't pray. So, so we need to perhaps do both. So that's the first thing that we see that God provided for him was an, an avenue of prayer, and he prayed. The second thing is God used a godly friend, Jonathan. And, and we read this in verses 16 and, uh, to 18. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father, Saul, will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father, Saul, knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home. But David remained at Horish. This was possibly the last time that David and Jonathan were together. There were two godly men. They, they were men of character. They were warriors. If you were picking up two teams to play touch rugby, you would want both of these guys on your team. They were two great guys, and they were great friends. But some people have said that they had a homosexual relationship. What rubbish. Why can't two godly men be friends? I, I, I know women love to have close friends, at least one good one. Men perhaps don't worry too much about that. But, but there's no reason why two men or more should not be, have a close relationship. You, you know, I think today the younger generation need role models like David and Jonathan, men of character, godly men. We need that in our country, desperately. And so uh, it is wonderful that he went and encouraged David there in the desert. I, I had two men that encouraged me as a younger person in my spiritual walk with the Lord, had a great influence on my life. And, and I went to them much later in life, not that many years ago. For Tommy Thompson, I had a job to track him down to where he was. And I just said to him, thank you for the time and for the influence, the, the time that you gave to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, disciple me. Uh, thank you for investing in me. And I want to thank you for it. And he, he, he didn't have too much longer to live. But I wanted to get that to him. Bernard, I, and his son and, whenever I went to his son, and I used to visit him. And, and uh, I know before he passed away that I also, and he appreciated so, that I said, thank you for investing in my life. Uh, godly people. Now, when you know somebody is stressed, they're going through a difficult time. The Holy Spirit may speak to you to visit that person. The Holy Spirit may say, well, well just phone them or send them a, a WhatsApp text. Send, let them know that you're praying for them or thinking of them. Uh, and, and so be a Jonathan to those people who are stressed. And on the other hand, if you are the stressed one, you need to find a Jonathan. And, and if you haven't got a Jonathan, this church has got a Roth, who is the care pastor. And, and you know, he's, he's got an um, honors degree in psychology. He's got a degree from the Baptist Theological College. He will listen to you. He will keep whatever you share with him confidential. So you will get professional 
counseling free of charge in this church. Karen is the same. She's got uh, degrees, a degree in psychology, and, and you can share your heart with her and with God, and it becomes confidential. Ask them the same thing. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it with the Lord. Go to somebody, a Jonathan. We have elders in the church. There are deacons in the church, godly men that you can go and speak to. So, God said, Jonathan, I want you to go and speak to my child, David, out in the desert. And Jonathan went and encouraged David. Isn't that wonderful? God used a godly gift. Thirdly, God provided something else for David. It was such a surprise. It, it was an absolute miracle that happened. I, I want you to get the picture. Here, here's this mountain, and on the one side is Saul and his two and a half thousand men. And on the other side of this mountain is David and his 600 men. David didn't have a drone to send up to see where, where, where Saul and his men were, so he didn't know. David didn't have a scout on the top of the mountain in radio contact with him, so he could say, Saul is coming this way or that way. He didn't know. And, and Saul was coming, and he was about to capture David and kill him. It was imminent. It was so close. And a miracle happened. A messenger comes to Saul and says, come home quickly. The Philistines are raiding us back home. And Saul says to the guys, hey guys, stop the chase. We're going home. And it was so close, and they withdrew, and they went home. That's a miracle that God provided. Tell you, it was something just so wonderful. Now, some people say, can, can God use the ungodly to fulfill his purpose? Well, yeah, God used the Philistines, who were godless people, to fulfill his purpose. Now, the miracle to me is not that the Philistines attacked. The, the miracle is, was, was the timing. I mean, just at that point, the messenger got there, and it was called off. I think you see that so many times, um, you know, march around seven times around the walls, and people say, oh, that was just an earthquake, that's why the walls came down. Oh, God can use an earthquake, but the timing, imagine if they'd gone around the seven times and the walls didn't come down, it only came down a month later, or something like that. The timing was perfect. For, for Joshua, crossing the River Jordan. God says, tell the priests to take the Ark of the Covenant, and when the soles of their feet touched the water, the water will stop flowing. And people say, you know, it was almost like it just a, 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 an earth um, came down, um, maybe in a bit of an earthquake or what, but an earth slide um, just came down rocks away and dammed up the water and, and then allowed the children to cross the River Jordan, which was in front. God could use that, yeah. But the timing, imagine when their feet touched the water and the water didn't stop flowing and they kept on going and their ankles were all wet and their knees were wet and they were waist high in water and the river still didn't stop. I mean, how would that look? But when their feet touched the water, that's when it happened. And so the, the timing, I think, yeah, is the thing. Uh, and so God provided this wonderful, wonderful thing. 
And so God can use the ungodly to fulfill his purpose. And we read about that in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. The king's heart is in the hands hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. So God can use them. This miracle, of course, we read about that in verses 26 and 28. Just the last thing, just the final thing, is God provided a place for David. In verse 29, and David went up from there and lived in the strongholds, and some translations say in the hiding places of Engedi. In, in the area of Engedi, it's a desert area, but there are many caves. And it was in one of these caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And, and so there are a number of these um, caves where he could hide and he would be safe. Hiding places. And if you read on to the next chapter, the opening verse or two, you will find that David is hiding way back in a cave and Saul comes along to that very cave to relieve himself and that's where David sneaks up and cuts off a piece of his garment. That was the hiding places that God provided for David where he could stay. Now when you read the Psalms again and you read about where David perhaps says, God is my rock. He's not talking about Masada, the big rock that was a wonderful fortress. He's not talking about that. He's saying, God is my rock. God is my fortress. God is my stronghold. God is my hiding place. And I'm just praying that God will be your rock. That God will be your stronghold. That he will be your fortress. Let us just pray together as we close. Father, thank you for...